good morning, everyone. So happy to see all of you this morning and everyone who's online, a few online. Uh, my name is Autumn Payne. I am a student of Lama Jimpa for the past five years. And a lot of you know, I am also a documentary filmmaker and I run my own video production business. Today's topic is called The Healing Power of Narrative. And it's one of my most favorite topics. So I'm really excited to share that with you today. So first I wanted to acknowledge my teachers. I have a few of them in this area. The first one is Ms. Tamara Knox. She is the Director of Ethics and Social Responsibility for my business. And she's also a trauma-informed photographer. And she's taught me a lot about how narrative storytelling and documentary affects uh, the people that are being filmed and also our lighter world. So wanted to acknowledge that. I also wanted to acknowledge uh, Patrick Moreau. He um, studies the science of storytelling. He's an incredible filmmaker who, um, by studying it, he's shared what he's learned with myself and a lot of other students. So I've learned a lot from him as well. And then, of course, our dear teacher, Lama Jimpa, um, which means uh, Lama Yeshe Jimpa means generosity wisdom. And he's been so generous to share his teachings with myself and with all of you. And it is my sincere wish that I will transmit them to you as well in the best way possible. It's the most beneficial. So I'll be calling him Rinpoche during the talk, which means precious jewel, because that is what he is to me. So first, I thought it would be appropriate to begin this talk by sharing a story with you all. This is my daughter's book called Buddha at Bedtime. It even has pictures in it. Not too many pictures, just a little picture. Everybody wants to see the picture. This story is called The Princesses and the King Shuck Tree. Relax, be very still and listen. Listen carefully to this tale about the four princesses who lived in a grand palace in a distant land. They were very curious girls, so when they heard about a tree of breathtaking beauty, they longed to see it. They went to the gardener and they asked them him to take them to it. That very day, after their lessons, the gardener said, It would be my pleasure, your highnesses, but the king chef tree is a magic tree. People can only see it on their birthday. The rest of the time it is invisible. So I will only be able to take you one at a time, and you will each have to wait until your birthday. The princesses agreed and decided it was only right and proper for the eldest to go first. And so it was that on the eldest princess's birthday, a bright spring morning, the gardener and the girl set out to find the king shed tree. After walking for a while, they came to the edge of the royal forest where the gardener said that it grew. The princess saw a tall, rolly tree standing apart, but the gardener could see nothing, so she knew that this was indeed the magical king shuck. She stood entranced by the beautiful tree. Its small green leaves were unfurling like sparkling emeralds, and the princess was filled with its joyful energy. As they left, the gardener asked her not to talk about what had happened so that she wouldn't spoil the tree's magic for her sister. As spring rolled into summer, the second eldest princess celebrated her birthday, and the gardener took her to find the king chef tree. She gasped when she saw it, for it was an explosion of deep red blossoms, glowing like rubies. The princess swooned as she smelled the heavenly perfume of the magic flowers, which filled her with a great sense of happiness. The gardener asked her, too, not to discuss the tree until all the girls had seen it. The hot summer days were turning to autumn when the gardener brought the third princess to see the king shuck tree on her birthday. Her eyes widened when she saw its boughs crammed with luscious purple fruits, which hung from the tree like giant amethysts. The magic tree was so enticing that she felt as if it were feeding her with its goodness and generosity. And once again, the gardener asked her, like her sister, do not talk about the tree until all four princesses had seen it. Finally, as winter chased the last autumn leaves from the trees, the birthday of the fourth and youngest princess arrived. Now the gardener took her, too, to visit the king shuck tree. 
She asked to be taken at night as she wanted to see it in the moonlight. And sure enough, the silvery branches wet with dew looked spectacular and sparkled as if they were dressed in silver threads laced with tiny diamonds. She felt as if the mystical tree was wrapping it in its warmth and magic. The day after the youngest princess visit, the four girls went to thank the gardener for taking them to see the magical tree. Relieved that they could finally discuss it among themselves at last, the eldest princess said, I will never forget that beautiful tree with its tiny leaves shimmering like emeralds in the afternoon sun. Oh, but sister, you must be mistaken, cried the second oldest princess. The kingshuk tree was covered in huge ruby red blossoms, and its heady perfume filled me with great feelings of happiness. Oh no, sisters, you are both quite wrong, insisted the third princess. The kingshuk tree was heavy with luscious purple fruits, which sparkled like giant amethysts. Well, sisters, I think you must have seen different trees, cried the youngest princess. The kingshuk's branches were covered in threads of glittering dew that enchanted me with their magic. Had the sisters not been so well-mannered, there might have been an argument. But instead, they simply wondered if they had seen four different trees. The gardener laughed. Your Highnesses, he said, you have indeed seen the same kingshuk tree and experienced its magic, but it was dressed for the season of your birthday when each of you visited. To truly appreciate the tree, you need to visit in all seasons, which is, of course, impossible because of its invincibility. The girls realized that the only way they would be able to discover more about the magical kingshuk tree was by listening to and learning from each other and anyone else who'd been lucky enough to see it. Isn't that nice? Oh, it's a beautiful story. So it's so human to tell stories, right? We start telling stories to our children, and by the end of our lives, we're telling the same stories over and over again so that people behind us don't forget. And it connects us through time as well, the stories that we with, uh, Rama calls them uh, narrative meditations that we speak at the beginning of each talk, right? We, this is, these are stories that have been passed to us down the lineage for thousands of years. And by repeating them, you know, it carries the story through generations. So first, talk a little bit about what is a narrative and what is a story. So generally speaking, a story is a retelling of events. Um, it could be fictional or it could be true story. And then the narrative is the meaning or value that we place upon that telling of events. In my mind, a story is always a narrative because it's kind of impossible in our human ways to not hear a story and play, have some meaning made out of it. So I'm gonna use those words interchangeably, narrative and story. Um, there is something called narrative therapy, which I'm not an expert on, but the gist of narrative therapy is that it seeks to separate the events that happened in your life from the meaning which you have placed upon it and rewrite the narrative in a, in a helpful way for your life, because we actually do get to decide what meaning we want to make out of the events. We may not change the events, but we can absolutely change or construct the narrative in a helpful way. And you'll notice that I say helpful versus unhelpful instead of good or bad narratives, right? That's the way I like to think of it. Is this narrative helpful or is it unhelpful to me? Because narratives can cause us quite a bit of pain too, um, but we can decide to um, turn it into something helpful if we wish. So that's what I'm gonna talk about. So we all have a personal narrative. Personal narratives are extremely powerful. And what a personal narrative is, is the story that we tell ourselves about ourselves. And the story we tell ourselves about ourselves defines what's possible for us. Like we're never gonna be able to go further than what we tell ourselves is possible. And uh, Patrick's done a lot of studies He's really good at diving into these long, complicated scientific articles, which I would be bored to tears, but he comes back and he can share the information. So that's why I'm referencing him. And he's seen over and over in these scientific studies where it has proven 
that what people will believe is what becomes true for themselves. So for example, they gave a group of people um, a placebo, but they told them that it was steroids. And those people documented the same amount of muscle growth as the people who actually received the steroids. So it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty amazing. So stories are reinforced and they're shared through a process of repetition. I think we could probably all agree that we just have a, we're really good at repetition. <laughs> We have a lot of repetition going on around here. Um, the more we repeat ourselves to a story, the more solid it feels to us, the more real it feels to us, the more entrenched we get into that, that narrative. And we also have a little thing called negativity bias, where we are prone to focusing on the negative stories. Um, so for example, if someone gives you 10 pieces of feedback, nine of them are positive and one of them is negative, which one are you gonna ruminate over? That one negative. And that's our, our bias towards the negative. But the good news is we, these stories are malleable. They're not fixed. They are not solid. That's the good news. And by applying some of our mind training and different techniques, um, we can work with them and, and realize their true nature. So I'll give you a, an example in my business as a documentary filmmaker. Um, I can say I'm gonna do a five minute film on someone's life and I'm gonna interview them for one hour. I could conduct that one hour interview in an infinite number of ways. And then when I edit that interview into five minutes, I can choose what I leave out, what I put in, and construct that story in an infinite number of ways as well. So I am very aware as a creator that, you know, these narratives are indeed constructed, which is why in our business, you know, my company, Ethical Narrative, that's what it's called, we focus very heavily on ensuring that our stories are helpful in nature, not just for uh, the people that are hearing the stories, but also for the person who's being featured in the stories. And so I wanna give you an example from the brilliant Miss Tamara Knox. I don't know if she's in here, but she'll at least see the recording. Um, she made an example of, of narrative in action through the arts. And this is this book that she just completed a little while ago, Surviving to Thriving, Narratives of Com Community Thrivers Surviving Trauma. So this is about people who have survived trauma and we hear you know, we used to call them victims, right? Trauma victims. And then it evolved to now we call them survivors. Now she takes it a step further and says thrivers. And it's just brilliant. And the way she's, okay, think in your mind, like how do you picture a, uh, like a do domestic vi violence victim or survivor? If I was a photographer, normally I'm gonna try to make it all shadowy and dark and sad, right? That's not what she did. She went in and she photographed them in the style of a high-end portrait photographer in New York and made these beautiful portraits of them smiling and showing what's possible after trauma. And then she, this is her, by the way, this is Miss Tamara, uh, beautiful. And each person, they were asked to choose the color of the background, so they're getting some agency. They're asked to write their own story instead of us writing them for for them like we normally do. And there's all different ages, there's all different races, and it's like 70 pages here, like 18 people profiled telling their stories. Just really beautiful. So a very good example of how narrative can be used uh, with artists working with people as well. So. This book is being distributed to victim services organizations so that people, when they're going through trauma, they can see a path forward. That opens up what's possible for them, right? Because they see someone else doing it. So um, I'll just pass this around if you want to look at it. And it is available to purchase if anyone's interested. Come and I'll share a link for you. So, yeah, it's beautiful. You're welcome. 
Thank you. So she says, so that other people can hear that this is very sacred work that's needed. So I will be sure to tell Tamara that she will appreciate that. Um, so now I'm going to get a little vulnerable here and share a little bit about my own personal narrative and how I've decided to engage with it using some of this new techniques. So when I before I came to the temple, I was very much entrenched in a very negative narrative about myself. And part of it goes back to what we we're talking about in our last talk here about women and strong energy and like having to push it down, suppress it. So I had a lot of fire energy in me, but really nowhere to put it, no example of what to do with this energy. So I just stuffed it down and it really came out in like a more self-destructive way. So um, I decided to write this, this, I was inspired to write this little story about myself because for me, what really works is uh, metaphor and visuals. So I wrote a story about my own fire energy, which I am now embracing. <clears throat> my main constitution is fire. I am a comforting fire that crackles in the hearth of my home and keeps my children warm. I am a fire that transforms raw materials into nourishment for the bodies of my loved ones. I am a fire dancer, creating illusions with my art that brings inspiration to those who see it. I am a prescribed burn that stops a raging fire in its tracks, suffocating it from harming others. I am glowing coals beneath the earth, a slow burning energy that warms the soil. I am a single flame of a candle kept lit in vigil until someone I care about comes back or hears my call from afar. My fire is never out of control or a flash in the pan, but an integral source of energy from which I can draw upon at any time and in any way I choose. Fire delights, fire excites, fire is inspiration, it is creation, it is transformation, it is warmth, it is love, it is comfort and care. Fire is loyalty and commitment, it is a magical display. It can't be pinned down, it can't be controlled, but when treated with reverence and skill, fire is anything I need it to be. Because that's my story. <laughs> And I'm sticking to it. <laughs> okay, so for me, I found that when working with stories, it become entrenched that what's most helpful is a process of adding a story rather than trying to take the story away. So we can't tell ourselves like, that story's bad. You need to stop it. That's not going to work. It, it, that's It's better to like add something positive and focus on sorry, helpful, add something helpful, focus on that, and then you'll find that the unhelpful narratives will kind of dissolve. And also we wanna take an attitude of self-care over banishment. So like that part of me is bad and I shouldn't be telling that story. It's like, no, maybe that part needs a lighter, more caring hand. So you can take care of that part of yourself. And then in the process of doing that, um, you know, those unhelpful feelings will start to dissipate on their own. So, I accidentally printed on both sides of the paper. Uh-oh, where am I? Anyway, the next, the next part I wanted to go over was, here it is, interpersonal narrative. So this is when it gets really tricky, is when, our stories meet other people's stories. And when you have conflict and when you, stories can bring us together or they can separate us, right? They can highlight the fact that we're all connected and they can bring us um, more peace and point out truth, or they can highlight prejudice and anger and contribute to the othering that we do. Those I would call unhelpful stories. Um, so when you're in a conflict with someone, um, what happens a lot of times is that we bring our own personal narrative in and then that other person brings their own personal narrative as well. And a lot of times they have nothing to do with each other. So what I find really helpful is to really 
look at what is the issue at hand and is there some action that needs to be taken there and then looking at your own personal narrative separately and if if this conflict has triggered you then to take care of yourself and that part that that's triggered needs some kind of self-care right so if you can give yourself the care and address that part then you can more clearly uh, look at the issue at hand and deal with that separately and do the actions that are needed. Now, you can't guarantee the other person's going to do that, but <laughs> but it does reduce the suffering quite a bit when you can. And, you know, dialogue, of course, will help you. Like some people, someone may be taking it entirely in a different direction that has nothing to do with you. So dialogue can be helpful or just dealing with the issue is. Um, so it's very interesting as we come together how those stories layer on top of each other. So Rinpoche says to ease conflict, we need to start with a shared narrative. And of course I asked him, what, does, what is a shared narrative? What's a good example of a shared narrative? And he said, it's not the solution. It's not the compromise. It's not... Um, anything that complex it's usually something very simple like um we're breathing the same air I'm like okay i can do that we can all do that start there right so now moving on to helpful interpersonal stories um they can connect us and share truths about the world so i'm going to share with you the story of the parable of the mustard seed very famous Buddhist story, which many of you may be familiar with. But I'll perform it for you. I'm feeling very performative today. Okay. So Kisa's only child, a very young son, had died. Unwilling to accept his death, she carried him from neighbor to neighbor and begged for someone to give her medicine to bring him back. One of her neighbors told her to go to Buddha and asked him if he had a way to bring her son back to life. Bringing the body of her son with her, Kisa found Buddha and pleaded with him to help bring her son back to life. He instructed her to go back to her village and gather mustard seeds from the households of those who have never been touched by death. From those mustard seeds, he promised he would create a medicine to bring... Uh -oh. ...her son back to life. Relieved, she went back to her village and began asking her neighbors for mustard seeds. All of her neighbors were willing to give her mustard seeds, but they all told her that their households had been touched by death. They told her, the living are few, but the dead are many. As the day became evening and then night, she was still without any of the mustard seeds that she had been instructed to collect. She realized then the universality of death. Kisa's mind finally began to realize that she wasn't alone or unusual in losing a child. She realized that the universe was not picking on her and singling her out for a special punishment. This is just what happened. Children sometimes died, and her tour of the city had shown her that it happened a lot. She was just one amongst many grieving parents, and she must do as they had all done and take her child to the cemetery to bury him. Still feeling the pain of loss, but with a heart no longer disturbed by anger and denial, Kisa then accepted the death of her son and lovingly carried him on his final journey to the cemetery. And then later she became a uh, student of Buddha or an arhat, I think it was. So yes, stories connect us with one another and help us realize universal truths. So now I wanted to talk about, oh my goodness, I'm just going to have to wing it. Um, Buddhist practice. So it was really interesting. I, I Googled actually, not expecting to get anything back, like narrative therapy and Buddhist practice. But you know what? A lot came up. It's It's kind of interesting that Long before the term narrative therapy was coined, and that Buddhists have had all these practices that really um, work as narrative therapy. So, um, 
first, I'd also like to point out that there's so many different ways that we hear and, and internalize and embody stories. And it is helpful to know what your own constitution is, what makes sense for you. So if some are very musical people, my friend Jay, um, he's, he posted recently that he plays the same song that's positive in nature every morning to start his morning routine. And so that music is going to help him like start his day in a positive manner. For me, I'm very visual and metaphor driven. If I hear a really great metaphor, like I understand it and I, I can just like be it. So I really gravitate towards that. Um, it can be movement, you know, so it can be oil. It can be, you know, scholarly study, you know, so we have in our practices, many things that we do that are physical, uh, oral, and um, visual that we can draw upon and we repeat them. So we're really using that, that process of repetition to um, reinforce these helpful stories in our lives. Um, So yes, I totally lost my place, but I was going to bring up um, the DD yoga, right? So DD yoga is this very visual representation of the enlightened qualities that we all possess. And by visualizing these qualities, um, we can, we're essentially telling ourselves a positive story about ourselves, but we have to repeat it. We have to keep doing it over and over again. And I've been doing Kala Chakra for a little over two years every day. And almost for the first two years, like it was, definitely felt like I was going through the motions. I was doing it on faith because Rinpoche said it would be helpful. And we had this beautiful teacher come and teach it. So I was just, I was doing it. But it's like the words are kind of weird and the symbolism is like, you know, you're just like, oh man, I don't know. But then after doing it for so long, all of a sudden, like around November, it just came to life. Like I began to like really feel it. And I began to feel that it was me. And I began to have so much power in my life because it gave me um, the strength to, to be present in a really complicated world. So Kala Chakra is, you know, represents the union of wisdom and right action. And it's got all these arms doing all these complicated things, sort of like me juggling all these things. But, but I really, you really got to stick with it, and it'll start opening up. And then, and then the other incredible visual that we have is Vajra Yogini, right? She's this red, naked female deity, and she's trampling on, you know delusion and hatred and she's very triumphant and so that that one's really meaningful to me because um as bodhisattvas we want to be of benefit in our world right but we need to tell ourselves these positive stories we need to build each other or build ourselves up so that we can meet the challenges of the world of the world so we need to be able to defend others that need help right um Buddhism is not about saying that everything happens for a reason and everything's okay. We should be grateful for every horrible thing that ever happened. Um, as Rinpoche says, like child abuse is never okay. Never. So I'm fully convinced that when parents don't show up for their kids, it's because they don't have the personal resources to do it. So we need to build up our personal resources by telling ourselves good things and building up our reserves so that we can properly be there for our children and also for our friends and our family and anyone else that needs to uh, meet unhelpful actions with helpful actions, right? Um, and then meditation. So. When we meditate, we're not as interested in what the stories are, but how they function. 
right? So we kind of let go of that judgment of, well, this story's good and this story's bad. And I shouldn't think that and I shouldn't think this. You're, you're more interested in how do they appear and how do they disappear? And then you get to realize that they're just like these fireworks, this display of like, ooh, look at that one. Oh, that's a big story. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. And you get to realize like how imaginative and wonderful we are. And in the process, when you begin to realize how malleable they are, then you can work with them better, right? And um, it's like learning to survive in the ocean. Like you can't stop the waves, but you can learn how to surf, right? So once you familiarize yourself with how temporary these stories are, how not fixed they are, at some point you begin to see a bit of what's underneath which is beyond the story, that is that indestructible Buddha nature that we all carry within ourselves. And we begin to recognize it, you know, in our teacher, because our teacher demonstrates it so well. And then we begin to recognize it within ourselves. And then after a while, you start seeing it in other people. And you can have these moments where all the stories drop away. And you begin to see people with clear eyes. And it's so beautiful. And as Rinpoche says, ah, there you are. That is all. So now I'd like to open it up to a shared narrative with all of you. Thank you, Autumn, for that wonderful talk. You're welcome. I was at the meditation in the dojo just prior to your talk, and I love the way your talk segued. But they segued. <laughs> Charla was talking about, um, you know, how we tend to uh, say bad things and feel bad things about ourselves that we wouldn't necessarily say or do to others. So if you were there this morning, you know what I'm talking about. And then um, as Charlotte was only sitting a couple people away from me, and then she wanted to go this way to talk, and, and that was too quick for me, so I wasn't ready. <laughs> but by the time we got about over there, I thought, oh, now I know what I want to say. But then it was too late, so I'll say it now. <laughs> okay. um, so many years ago, I heard someone say that you should never – don't say anything about yourself that you don't wish to be true. And maybe some of you have heard me say that because when I catch somebody doing that, like saying, oh, I'm so stupid, I'll, I'll bring that up. Um, now, having said that, I don't always do that for myself because, you know, that's just how we tend to be sometimes. Um, but when, when you say something negative about yourself, it's like you said you reinforce it. And then you keep doing that. And then it can become your reality. And it can become the way other people see you, too. Um, so anyway, I just love the way the two parts melded together so nicely. And thank you for your talk. Yeah, and I think that the important thing to recognize, too, especially for us who are all very humble, sensitive people, is we don't we have this inclination, we want to be humble, right? We don't want to like say that, oh, I'm so great. But when you really think about it, like how does that serve the world? How does that help us be better bodhisattvas? Because the reason we want to build ourselves up is to be of benefit to others. And that is very valuable. So yeah, it was very hard for me to come up here and like tell you the story about how amazing I am. Like it was very hard, you know, but, but I am amazing. And you're all amazing too, right? So we can build ourselves and others up, but but the reason for doing that is not to be conceited, it's to be of benefit to others. Okay, so I have an add-on. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
and some of you know this too about me is I keep a gratitude journal and I write in it every morning. So I wake up and one of the first things I do is I go to my book and I write down the things that I'm grateful for um, when nothing's happened yet in the day, but I think about what I'm grateful for and I write down five things. Um, but in my journal, I also write the things like as if I'm asking the universe for something. And uh, these are things that I want to happen. And, and then I also write what I want for today, how I want the day to be. And then at the end of the day, I write five things that I was grateful for that happened that day. Oh. And it could be the same things every time. I mean, some things I'm always grateful for, so they always end up in my pages. But what never is allowed on my pages is anything negative. Oh so I goodness. try not to even use um, negative words like not or no, or I try to keep everything positive, like an affirmation. Um, now, why did I bring that up? Oh, oh, I remember. <laughs> so um, recently I started adding to my universe portion of it uh, that I want to love myself, which kind of ties in also because I can be very hard on myself and I can think terrible things about myself. And I, I don't know why, but I just do it. So um, that's something that I've started to include in my universe. And the other thing is to be a better person. And so then they go together, like you just said. If you don't have that self-love, then how can you, if you don't think you're good, how can you display or give goodness to others? It's like, well, I'm not good, so I don't have any of that to give. Mm -hmm. So that's been included in my universe portion of my, um, my daily journal. And how long have you been doing that for? My journal or the, yeah, the, the, the gratitude part? Just starting oh, that journal, starting that ritual of oh, yeah, the gratitude journal. Um, about three years. Yeah, three that's powerful. Years. Just repeating yeah. that. So yeah, I do it every day. Yeah, every morning, every night. And Thanks. I think also too, when people are struggling with self love, is is that I think you can start with love for another or you know visualizing the deity right like we're not at first saying we are the deity we're like really getting to know what that is outside of ourselves then it can become part of ourselves so do, do you know what i'm saying like when you can recognize it in others then at some point you can start recognizing it in yourself it's just it takes time because you've got a whole lifetime of negative self-talk you know but i truly believe that it's gonna through that repetition it's gonna shift yeah so i have an interesting question uh okay. you brought it up and so did susan the power of language uh if we tell ourselves these internal stories and we use certain words you know it's thought to believe that some words are higher vibrational language and other, one, other words are lower vibrational language. So for an example, uh, being a fighter versus being a warrior, mm -hmm. you know, if you're a fighter, you tend to fight just to fight, whether it's with yourself or with others, but with a warrior, there's always that they only fight when they have to defend something, usually like a village or uh, a life purpose or something like that so what kind of advice would you give to help people redefine those inner narratives with helpful language well yeah just by starting with understanding language and choosing the words uh, intentionally that you use to refer to yourself like you said the warrior um the warrior word versus that or I'm a thriver. I'm not just a survivor and I'm not a victim. I'm a thriver, you know? And at first you might not believe it. You've got to keep repeating that word over and over again. And for me, like I said, helpful versus unhelpful instead of positive and negative, which feels too like dualistic, you know? So it, it can be hard 
without talking to other people or finding out what other people are thinking to even recognize that those words are ones that you're using that are having an unhelpful effect, you know? So sometimes by studying it, you can find those words that mean more or work better. I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah. Are you guys okay if I get a little bit vulnerable here? <laughs> yeah, just say all we're all about you. <laughs> okay, so what this makes me think of are some of the possibly not helpful stories that have um, scripted part of my life. Um, one of them, I'm, I'm just going to go into like very minor detail, just so you can understand the significance of the end. Um, when I was in the army, in basic training, they uh, identified a, a blood disease. And so in basic training, they put me in the hospital and I had to get a spinal yeah. tap. And um, I had so I, I had just turned 18. I was two weeks. I just turned 18. I had to sign all this paperwork saying that if they paralyzed me, I wouldn't sue them. And so they were talking to me about what are you going to do if you're paralyzed and we have to kick you out? Where, where are you going to go? So I called my dad. My parents had just divorced. And I said, Dad, they, they said they might have to kick me out. I might get paralyzed. What do I do? Where do I go? He said, well, I don't know, but you can't come here. So I was talking to a priest that ran a halfway house. It was scary. It was a scary time. It's okay. It's okay. So I was angry for a long time and angry at my father. And then I was in Europe. I got uh, stationed in Europe. And he came out to Europe and said he wanted to see me. And so I said, yeah, whatever. So he came out and we traveled a little bit. And I, we were about to part ways. I was going to go do some youth hosteling, traveling, and he was going to go see family. And he said, I felt like you've been disappearing from the family, separating. Like, and, I said, and then I told him, you know, how could you have done that to me? Uh, and he started bawling, right? He was, I think, um, so ashamed. And over the course of time, uh, I had problems with them because once I became a parent, then you realize, how could you do that to your kid? So we had kind of a rocky relationship for many years, but I, I realize now how I've, I've grown, matured, and changed that story. And it's now become more of a story, really, of sadness for my dad to not recognize the importance of that relationship when he needed to. And to not and to know that he's going to carry this guilt of not being there for his child. So I moved beyond that. I'm I'm glad I'm not the angry person I used to be. But um, and today I feel like when we're talking about grace or talking about your inner inner Buddha, today I'm the person that's there for him. Hmm. I'm the person that's flying to Florida to take care of him when he gets knee replacement surgery. I'm the person that took him or took him with me on the vacation that he didn't have with his wife who passed away. I'm the person that flew with him to South America. Um, so the relationship has totally evolved and and the story has changed. Wow, thanks for sharing that. Really highlights how stories are so powerful in our lives. Anybody else like to share something? Do we have any reserves that we need to ask a question? Let's see the chat okay. here. Jeff. Jack, if you could unmute me. Oh, that's not, that's ours. We really appreciate someone from Zoom to participate with any of you feeling called to. I see you smiling, Emily.
What about Mr. F1J? I, I just don't want to at one time. I don't want someone. Possible? Is that Aaron? Aaron? Did Aaron want to speak? Aaron? Aaron? Oh, he said wonderful story to whoever spoke. Probably they were not able to get you on camera. So acknowledging your story. <laughs> yeah. So, oh, so um, oh, it's not here. So okay, I I don't have a whole lot to say other than um, those that know me know I come from a really big family and um, and a long time ago I I. Uh, I told uh, Rinpoche, I said, you know, it seems there's 10 of us. And I said, it seems like I uh, I said it in a frustration because my narrative was so different than some of my siblings. And I said, it seems like we, it seems like we're all from a different family. And then he said, well, you actually are. That's what he said. <laughs> you know, because you know how we have the same experience, but our lens is different. That's mm -hmm. what it came to me, you know. Like the kingship tree. Yeah, you know, and, and I could spend a lot of time saying, that's not how it was, you know, but it, for them, it was different. Mm -hmm. So that, yeah. yeah, so that I just thought to mention that. Yeah. True. <laughs> okay. I think, and I won't take it out of there since you can have it. I always think the shorthand, if you distill everything that you researched, so not to diminish from that, because goodness sakes, that was a lot of research. But if you distill it all down, right, the quote of Henry Ford is, if you think you can or you think you cannot, you are correct. Absolutely. Oh, that's such a good one. Yeah. Yeah, I tell my my daughter that. She doesn't appreciate it. <laughs> She'll appreciate it. She'll appreciate it. My mom and you can't. She'll appreciate it when she gets older. Or my, my dad would say a rude version of that which i'll clean up since we're going to be recording okay. the clean version of it is uh never be first in line to kick your own butt uh, yeah that's a good one that's the clean version. good dad nice yeah, yeah, you got yeah. It. <laughs> yeah. it's the chat oh hand up okay so augustino would you like to speak Yes, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. We can hear you. Thank you. I first want to say thank you, Autumn, um, for sharing everything that you did. There's quite a bit that resonated with me and I'm grateful for that. Um, my question is, um, I also work within the documentary field and I'm wondering if you could tell me your understanding of what is the difference uh, between maybe traditional documentary filmmaking and ethical documentary filmmaking. I imagine that you imbue some of, uh, if not quite a bit of the knowledge um, that you have gained from uh, Buddhist thought. Uh, but I'm curious about that difference. That's a big question. We actually have a whole course in ethical storytelling, which we teach. Um, you know, there's different types of filmmakers out there, but I, I think one of the problems is, is this idea that we're coming in as an objective documentarian, which really doesn't exist. If you say that you're being objective, that means that your implicit bias has free reign to wreak havoc in the storytelling area. So you know, step one for responsible storytelling really is to excavate your own biases and be aware of what they are so that you don't repeat harmful narratives um, when you're doing stories about other people. Because, um, I mean, I'm guilty of this too. I worked in the news business for 14 years and I felt like as long as I go in there and I'm not being partial, then all is well, you know. But I also noticed that I would only be in certain neighborhoods if I was reporting on crime. I was never there or on poverty, but I was never 
in those same neighborhoods doing, say, a human interest story. So it's really important when you are a storyteller to be very intentional about what messages you're sharing with other people. So that's the first part. And then the second part is what effect is it going to have on that person's psyche? So like, I wonder sometimes like, how did the Tiger King documentary sit with, you know, the Tiger King himself? Like, was that helpful on his path to become a Buddha? <laughs> Did it not matter? I don't know. When you have your story told back to yourself, that's super powerful. So um, I just think it's about awareness and being, um, you know, just very intentional about it. There's a lot more there, but that's the cliff notes. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Maybe this book could be um, in the roar, like a link to it. Oh yeah, we can put a link in the roar for the yeah. So the surviving the thriving book, really good for people who are um, working with trauma or you know running a therapy business. Or so many people can benefit. So we'll put a link to that in the roar. Yeah, in the chat. Right? So yeah, you can find it easy. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. it's just fantastic work. Yeah. Anyone else? Does anyone have a lunch narrative going through their head right now? <laughs> okay. All right. Okay, I think we're good. Is, is this is this on? These are the merits of these two sections. sections. May I quickly take the state of the Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May this, this green jewel of the cheetah that is not arisen or rise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish but increase more and more. In the land of circle by snow mountains, is here the source of all happiness and good. All power of which and my sentient thing yet so please remain until samsara ends. May the, may the teachings of the Buddha flourish, and may the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May, may all my days achieve happiness, and may they achieve all their temporary and ultimate goals. Most no sound, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones. Merciful giver of the stream of profound and vast instructions for the fortunate migrators. We will remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Our Lord today, our great treasure of optical compassion. Manjushri, master of all his wisdom, Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire host of Maras, Sankhapa, crown jewel of the snowy land sages, low Sankhapa, and make requests at your holy feet. Thank you. Thank you, Autumn. You're welcome. For um, announcements, uh, we have expressions on the 29th, which is coming up very soon. Dance, music, poetry, all the arts, and then um, we just recently, just actually yesterday, um, were confirmed for Ling Rinpoche. He's a very special teacher. Um, in his uh, former life, he was the tutor, the main teacher of the Dalai Lama. And he's going to come here on the 29th. And uh, that's a, a Wednesday. And more will be more will be revealed, as Lama, <laughs> Lama Jinpa always says. So um, I don't have a lot of details yet. But as soon as they come, we'll share them with everyone. Thank you. Omo araya pazaya na aindi Om araya pazaya na